Good afternoon. This is Pastor Jeff. It is Wednesday, June 7th. I'm in my office before I go and preach here in a little bit for our Wednesday evening worship service, which is at 6 o'clock. Our scripture reading is Matthew 28, 16 through 20. So what I am doing during the summer, we're having the two worship services, one on Sunday morning, one on Wednesday evening, and it's going to be the same service. And so I'm waiting to upload the sermon until after the Wednesday. Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and then the message. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. So I am so glad that you have decided to worship with us this morning. This morning, we have two big milestones that are occurring in the life of the church. Earlier in the service, Livia, Noah, Finn, and Aaliyah affirmed their baptismal promises that their parents made when they brought them to the font. Later on in the service, Jeremy, Henry, Leo, Thea, Penny, Mason, Peyton, and Addie will come to the altar rail and celebrating First Communion and the classes that they participated in to help them prepare for the moment. These two milestone celebrations are very appropriate to celebrate on Trinity Sunday. In the Western world, we always celebrate Trinity Sunday the Sunday following Pentecost Sunday, where we celebrate the coming of the Spirit. I will fully admit to you that when I became familiar with the lectionary, I was confused on why the gospel reading for today was chosen. I grew up seeing this text as simply the Great Commission. I did not see it any other way. However, in this text, we see the groundwork for the Trinitarian language when we hear Jesus' command to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, I am going to shy away from the Trinity conversation today. The icon that you see on the screen is the hospitality of Abraham. I'm sorry that you do not see it. But it is type of the Trinity, but not a representation of the Trinity itself. On Thursday, Dory and I was flipping through photos and I landed here. I thought that it was going to be a good launching point. But I could not get away from the Great Commission. The Great Commission is the center of the Gospel text, and I could not move past it especially when we are lifting up children for the First Communion and teens for their affirmation of baptism. Maybe we can think of the words of Jesus as a pep talk. The disciples have mixed feelings running through their veins, including doubt. Their world has been turned upside down with the betrayal of Judas. At the core of the Great Commission are the following two words making disciples. We had a good conversation on making disciples at the Bible study on Tuesday. Examining the text on the surface, it seems like the means of making disciples is carried out by two words, baptizing and teaching. I think that the author of Matthew placed this story as the last story of the gospel because he wanted to emphasize to his readers how important the commission is on our life and now the life of the church. One of the things that stood out to me this week as I read and reread the passage was that they worshipped him and noting that some of them doubted. 
Now, when you dig deeper into this passage and the rest of Matthew, you will notice that these are not two different groups of people. We are not in a boxing arena where the announcer addresses the crowd in the following manner. In this corner, we have the worshiper. Now, in this corner, we have the doubter. No, they are linked together. The doctrines of our church can be tough to understand and to grasp and maybe implement into our lives. I am grateful that we no longer believe that students have to memorize, recite, and understand everything about church to be affirmed. They did not have to come into my office and give a clear understanding of the doctrine of Trinitarian to be here today. Then our children. They sat in three short lessons to give them a glimpse about communion. However, they do not have a full grasp of what happens at the altar rail each Sunday. A news flash, just in case, none of us really can fully comprehend what happens when we take the bread and the cup. What I have shared with the 12 students who have gathered today is that when they encounter God, they can know that God will shower them with grace and love. And the God of the universe will invite them into communion with them. That should be reassuring for them and for us. We don't have to have it all together. And we do not have to understand. We can just come. Then the passage finishes with pure joy. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have the presence of Jesus. Personally, I think that we need to hear those words often and that we should grasp a hold of them. Thus, as we are commissioned to go out, we need to share this good news. If you take a look at any mental health report that have come out, especially since COVID, isolation and loneliness are through the roof. Jesus assures us in this passage that he will always be a companion to us. When Matthew was written, there was great turmoil. They were in the aftermath of the Jewish war, and the temple had just been destroyed. The conflict in the region had accumulated in many losses and much devastation. The people were hurting, and the promise of Jesus' continuing presence helped them emerge through the darkest period of their lives. The text back then was guiding the early church to rethink its role. They were reminded that the whole gospel is about the presence of God in a world that adamantly opposed it. The same is true today. It urges us to examine what our place is in the midst of the overwhelming needs that we face. While it seemingly like the world is crashing around us, we have to hold on to the fact that there is nowhere that eludes God's presence. With God's presence, we have the capacity to obey. The word obey is a rough word, right? The exact words that the disciples heard were the following, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now that does not seem like an easy assignment. With it being a tough assignment, I wanted to dig a little bit more and share with you how the obedience is connected to discipleship and how it is connected to the children and youth who are here today to receive First Communion and affirm their baptism. Obedience is much more than accepting a certain doctrine. This is the reason that I believe why we have and are making shifts in what and how we teach the children and the youth of the church and 
what we are emphasizing in our teaching classes and in sermons. Obedience is truly a call for us to pursue a lifestyle that is based out of love and justice. Justice is a hot topic word nowadays. It was a very in-depth talking point in our Door County DEI meetings. However, it is also a word that is rooted in our baptismal vows. And those vows are the reason that the children and youth are here today. So let us hear those words again that the four students affirm. Live among God's faithful people. Hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. Proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed. Serve all people following the example of Jesus and strive for justice and peace in all of the earth. I truly believe that if we as a church took our baptismal vows seriously, we would see a huge change in us. The change would be noticed in our individuals' lives and in the communities of the churches. The call that we heard today in my thought is more about our daily practices in life than holding on to a common doctrine. One final word on this command. The command is not for us to go out and conquer the world with our Christian beliefs. Instead, the command is for us to liberate the world for Christ's sake. Jesus had this power and authority, and he turned it over to his followers. In Psalm, he refers to the power in the following manner. Your power is your love of justice, and the love of justice is tied to the words of Hosea and Micah in the Old Testament. So let me conclude by sharing those words of Micah. But he's already made it plain how to live and what to do. What God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. As we journey from this holy space, may we be challenged to live out our baptismal promises and be compassionate in our love to one another. And in this dog-eat-dog -dog world, let us not take ourselves too seriously, but may we, at all times, take God seriously. Amen.